Hi, I'm Katie Martin. I'm the Markets Editor at the FT and I'm here for a chat with Bruce Carnegie-Brown, who's the Chair of Lloyds of London. Bruce, thanks so much for coming along to chat to me today. Um, it's obviously, um, this is shaping up to be a pretty interesting year. It's been pretty tough for everybody. I mean, so from your point of view, what, what's the toughest almost? Is it is it COVID or is it Brexit or is it a combination of both? I'd say at the moment we're right in the teeth of the pandemic and that's the principal area of our focus. We have ongoing work with respect to making ourselves Brexit prepared uh, before the end of the year. But actually we started on that Brexit work um, over three years ago, immediately after the referendum, and we've set up um, a subsidiary of Lloyd's inside the European Economic Area uh, in Brussels. And we think we're ready, frankly, for whatever the Brexit outcome. There are some technical issues with transferring legacy policies into the European Economic Area, which is a, a legal process that we're still going through and need to complete by year end. But Brexit for us is substantially done. There are still better or worse <laughs> Brexits that might emerge, but we think we're uh, ready to take care of our, our customers, policyholders uh, on the continent of Europe um, in a post-Brexit world. So, so pandemic is really the area of our principal focus at the moment. Mm. And I guess kind of unsurprising for an event that has had such a substantial impact uh, on the economies of the world, on the societies around the world, we're seeing this in our claims experience. And unlike mm. uh, a sort of hurricane or a natural catastrophe, uh, where the claim and the event is limited by geography and time. This mm. pandemic is, of course, kind of everywhere and all the time. And most of us don't know when it began and it certainly hasn't ended. And so the complexity of managing the claims process there is, is truly extraordinary. So we think we're affected in uh, 16 different lines of business. Um, and those range from uh, very obvious things like event cancellation. We're a big provider of insurance around uh, event cancellation, so things like the uh, postponement of the Tokyo Olympics, the cancellation yeah. of Wimbledon, all of those things result in claims that are pretty straightforward to process. Travel claims clearly for lost lost travel are substantial. Trade credit things when when trade uh, gets uh, stuck uh, because of the pandemic around the world, and then of course business interruption uh, insurance, which has created some some particular challenges for the uh, industry. And then mm. uh, beyond the, the pandemic, and we think, you know, we did an assessment early in the pandemic process, and we think the total claims for the global wholesale insurance industry will be of the order of $100 billion for, for these claims. And we expect at Lloyd's to pay out about $6.5 billion in, in gross claims by the end of, of this year. But uh, so, so aside from the claims process, of course, there's been the focus on our own people, uh, both the, the corporation of Lloyd's people, but also the people that work in the Lloyd's Market, making sure that they're safe and secure through this, which has led, of course, to um, making sure we can work remotely. Uh, mm -hmm. And actually, I'm, I'm pretty encouraged by how quickly we've done that. We had to shut the underwriting room for the first time since the Second World War. Um, but actually, we haven't lost uh, very much of our capability and capacity as a result of doing that. And so really pleased with the way that the market has responded mm. to that. And we've tried to introduce more technology as we've reopened the underwriting room now. We've tried to introduce more digital technology to partner with people physically working in the underwriting room to try to yeah. make sure that we can blend the best of the physical uh, uh, existence that we had with the digital um, e existence. Well, yeah, um, I was going to ask, is there an element of a kind of forced modernization process here for, for how the industry works? Well, the truth is that Lloyd's has always been a bit more modern than people think. So they tend to think <laughs> around underwriting room and a lutein bell and liveried waiters and those kinds of things. But actually, we've been investing in digital technology for quite some time. And so a combination of sort of traditional digital means of communication like email, our emergency trading protocols for, for when the room uh, closed, but also an investment we made in a digital uh, insurance placing uh, system uh, three years ago now have really allowed us to move everything online reasonably mm. seamlessly. And it, it actually feeds into a broader strategy we have of investing in what we call the future at Lloyd's, which is making us really much more digital in our ways of, of taking data into the marketplace and processing that data. Uh, and actually, uh, paradoxically, of course, the pandemic, which has been uh, such a nightmare for so many people, has created um, greater adoption around these things for, for Lloyd's and to the point you've made, 
has accelerated, I think, the pace of some of that modernization and digitization of the market. So do you think you'll come out of this process as, a, as, as an industry that, that looks different and, and that operates differently? I mean, certainly from where we're sitting in, in the news business, we've completely ripped up the way that we worked and started all over again. Um, you know, do you think your industry will be the same? Um, I think it'll, it, it'll take some time for some of these changes to become rooted. I mean, if I separate the issue from the insurance industry specifically, I have some concerns that muscle memory runs quite deep. And so people's idea of return to normality will be to return to the way we were doing things before, whether in the insurance industry or elsewhere. And actually it's incumbent, I think, increasingly on business leaders to be framing what the new future should look like. Because I think all of us have to some extent enjoyed a different way of working. So nobody's missing their commute. Uh, if you've got a garden, you've been able to, to, to do things away from your screen and enjoy the spring and the summer here, which was, was actually a, a very positive experience in the United Kingdom this year. Um, <laughs> Um, and, and, and if we're not careful, we'll go back to everyone having to jump on train. And so I think employers and business leaders need to define their expectations of people as we emerge from the pandemic mm. so that it is OK for people to work from home. And job by job, we need to define how often people need to be present physically versus how often they can engage uh, remotely. Yeah. And we'll be trying mm. to do the same, I think, in the insurance industry. And there's a big opportunity there. And of course, it changes insurance risks. So, you know, yep. you may not know. Why would you know? But Theoretically, under your current um, uh, household policy, you're not allowed to work from home. Um, yep. and, uh, and your employer has essentially had to have an extension of their employment uh, insurance to cover you while you're at home. And so the industry has been working to create that kind of flexibility. So should you have an accident at home while on, the, on you know, at work, uh, yep. that the, the, the policy will pay. And so there are kind of impacts on the insurance industry that come from the, these new ways of working. Mm. And, and you mentioned that you think that the total sum of COVID claims will be in the order of $100 billion. How confident are you that you're going to be able to stick to that number? Do you think it is realistic? Well, we can't be precise uh, because no. one of the estimates we made is, is how soon the pandemic would come to an end. And, and it's still going. Um, yes. and of course, many parts of the world, including the United Kingdom, we're seeing already signs of second spikes. So it's, it's going on longer than the original uh, assumptions allowed. The other thing is that because of the complexity of the claims, they come through in different ways. So we talked about event cancellation being an obvious and immediate uh, kind of insurance claim. But ultimately, they will also come through in things like medical malpractice claims because people will be suing their doctors for not being properly treated through the pandemic. Um, they will come through in directors and officers insurance, which is where shareholders will sue companies that go out of business for not managing their business enterprises through these uh, these trying times and those things all take longer to come through and so there will be quite a long tail I think on these claims coming through. Yeah and what's the interface if you like between support for want of a better word through insurance and support through the government? Um, where, how are you going to take account of the assistance that companies and others have had through government when you're talking about how to make claims? Well, very specifically, uh, we've directed that um, our underwriting markets should not take into account um, uh, money paid by the government to businesses mm. in calculating the loss. And typically that would be used to net off the amount of the loss and therefore reduce the size of the insurance claim. And we've asked um, our insurers at Lloyd's to disregard the government funding when looking at the claims payment. And I, I hope that that is a, a customer friendly thing to do and, and definitely mm. Um, a, a way of helping our customers through this challenging time. More broadly, um, we are also advocating that government engages with the industry to create mm. more resilience. Um, what we've seen around the world is that we've not proven to be particularly resilient to this pandemic. And, mm. and although pandemic insurance policies were available, people didn't buy them because they didn't think the probability <laughs> of the risk was that high. And what we've seen in other sectors um, uh, around the world, so. In the UK, we do this around terrorism. Uh, we also do it around flood insurance, and the same in the United States around terrorism and flood. There are partnerships between the government and the industry right. which help build resilience in should, should this happen again. And we've put out several models um, which might engage the government um, in putting something in place should this event happen again. It's just too big an event for the insurance industry itself to, to shoulder alone. 
And what I always say yeah. to governments is that if yeah. there isn't any insurance, governments pick up the bill anyway, as we're seeing that they're doing around the world today. And so actually, if they create a partnership, um, the industry over time can take more of, of the responsibility onto its own shoulders. So if we look at the terrorism insurance program in the UK, um, originally 100% of that was provided by the government. But what the insurance industry did was build up a fund over a period of time to create a first loss against the government's ultimate indemnity. And so today, there's six and a half billion pounds of insurance capital provided by the insurance industry that would pay a terrorism claim first. But if it was bigger than that in terms of its impact, then the government would step in. And so that's a great example of a partnership between the, 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 the private industry and yeah. the government to create more resilience. And we certainly need to think about that as we uh, look at a pandemic recurring or indeed some other systemic yeah. event, right? Because before this pandemic came along, I would have told you that my biggest concern about systemic risk was that it would be a cyber attack, for instance, taking sure. out very different parts of the economy. And so one of the challenges with the existing terrorism insurance is that it can only be used for terrorism. It's not adaptable to be used in the pandemic. And so we've also been advocating more flexible structures to the government um, as a way of par partnering. And not just in the UK, we were advocating these things in the United States and in, in other countries around the world where Lloyds has a big uh, market presence. Mm, I guess it's, it's almost like a kind of retooling of, of the whole, of our, of our mindset and of the whole industry really, because, you know, like you say, if you'd said virus a few years ago, I'd have thought, you know, a cyber virus, it would never occur to me that something like this could happen. I mean, are you just having to go back to the drawing board in how you assess this as a risk? Well, we clearly are. Um, and particularly when uh, you underwrite on a certain basis, uh, business interruption insurance being a good one, and then the courts mm. find against you. And so there's a, there's a risk um, that we haven't been charging the right premium for the risk we've been taking, or there's a risk for our customers that they thought they were covered and they weren't. And that, that's mm. not a good place for the industry to be. So we need to relook at those kinds of issues. But what's clearly happening, and you see it in things like climate change as well, is that the nature of risk is changing over time. And we, yeah. we have models that, that we put this data into that adjust pricing. And one of the challenges is whether change is happening more quickly than our models are taking account of. Um, mm -hmm. But it's also about human behaviors. So, you know, we all have pressures on our cash flow and you can spend money buying protection for your mobile phone or you can spend money buying protection for pandemic and the mobile phone feels like a more immediate issue if you lose it and the pandemic might never happen. And so we're all a little bit victims of our own sense of, of, of what we're likely yep. to be exposed to. But I think what we increasingly know is that, that these remote events, these apparently remote events, have huge impacts when they, when they land. Yeah. So going back slightly closer to, to home and going back to the issue of Brexit, you say you, you feel like you're pretty much ready, you know, some kind of you know, legal arrangements notwithstanding. But, you know, you, you look at the, the nature of the talks between the two sides and how closely London can be integrated into EU financial services from January onwards. I mean, what, what do you think London is going to look like in a sense once we do cross that threshold into being completely out of the EU what will its role be in European finance do you think and in global finance well for me I think you have to separate the economics from the politics and unfortunately mm -hmm. they tend to get dominated by politics so when you look at kind of issues of equivalence between the UK mm -hmm. and the EU there's no doubt we are equivalent we've been equivalent for 40 years in the world of insurance um, Bermuda has equivalence for the European with the European Union on insurance contracts uh, and if that's true for Bermuda, it's surely true for the United Kingdom and, and London specifically. But the ultimate decision will be a political one based on conversations between, between political um, uh, parties and governments. Um, and what you have to do as a, as a business person is try to separate yourself from the politics and get yourself into the economics of what the impact might be and how you can build kind of resilience into your business model, but also try to make sure you can open your doors once... Yeah. Um, once this is resolved. Um, and that's what we've really been doing. And I, I think London, once we know what the rules are, London will prove to be extraordinarily uh, resilient, I think, mm. uh, and, and the financial services industry as well. And it, it, it's, of course, a huge industry for the United Kingdom, um, mm. both banking, insurance, asset management. And, uh, and I think it's actually a necessary industry at the moment that the European Union relies on to obtain mm. funding and liquidity and insurance coverage. Um, and one of the things specifically about insurance, of course, of the kind particularly that Lloyd's provides is that it is about 
collecting premiums from lots of places and lots of different uh, entities, but actually paying some very large claims when an event um, happens. You think about mm. a flood or a hurricane. And the same happens in the United, uh, in, in the European Union, that, that when events happen, what happens is we bring a huge amount of capital, and that is capital coming outside, from outside those economies, into those economies, mm. which feeds the recovery of those economies. And if you don't have mm. international com- capital coming in post an event, what you're doing is really just reallocating government budgets. And so it's a sort of zero sum game. So, you know, there is a real value to the ability to move capital across borders in a free way. And that's just an insurance example. Bankers would be able to give you daily yeah. examples of the value to the global economy of the free movement of capital around mm. the world. But we have to be very careful that we don't uh, end up ring fencing capital geographically around the world in a way that works to the detriment yeah. of and citizens. Yeah. I mean, it's funny, I think when, when a lot of people talk about the city, they mean banking. But as you say, it's about much more than that. It's about banking and asset management and insurance. But the only bit that I guess you can, you know, really make your mark on, I guess, is, is the insurance piece of that. Do you feel like it will still be, London will still be an important global player once this is all done? Yes. And actually, um, for Lloyd's, um, that, that, that you can make that statement with even greater confidence because it's only... Right. 14% of our business comes out of the European Union. We get 45% of our business out of the United States. So on a relative basis, unlike many other trade flows around the world, we are disproportionately focused on North America and places like Australia and New Zealand mm. uh, relative to our focus on the European Union. So we have less downside risk in this. But equally getting this right would give us some upside opportunity. And, and that's yeah. one piece we also want to capture uh, going forward. This shouldn't just be a defensive activity. It should, we should be trying to compete uh, internationally for a business to continue to come to London, whether it's in banking or asset management. Uh, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Well, uh, Bruce, we, we could talk all afternoon, but I think we're, we're not allowed and our, and our time is pretty much up. Best of, best of luck to you in the, in the final months of the year. Next year can, simply cannot be worse. So the only <laughs> way is up. <laughs> Thank you, Katie. I'm, 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 I'm aligned with your wishes. <laughs> <laughs>